The electron configuration of an atom tells us how many electrons the atom has and which orbitals those electrons are in. So we find the electron configuration using something called the off-bra principle. And this basically describes a hypothetical process in which atoms are built up by adding electrons one by one. And so as the electrons are added, they go to the most stable position. In other words, the lowest energy orbital that's not occupied yet. So hydrogen has one electron, so that one electron will go into the 1s subshell, since that's the lowest energy subshell available. So we denote the one electron with this superscript above the s in the 1s subshell. And so in addition to the electron configuration, we can draw an orbital diagram, which represents, we have these boxes for each orbital, and then we represent an electron with an arrow. And the arrows can either point up or down, depending on which way they spin. So then next we have helium with two electrons. The second electron will also go into the 1s orbital, since it's the 1s subshell is lower in energy than the 2s. So due to the Pauli exclusion principle, we know that if two electrons are in the same orbital, they have to have opposite spins. So we draw the second electron pointing down. Next we have lithium. The third electron can't go into the 1s subshell since it, this orbital already has two electrons. So it goes into the next lowest orbital, which is the 2s. And then we have beryllium, the fourth electron. Again, it pairs up with the electron in the 2s subshell because the s subshell is lower in energy than the p. And then in boron, the last electron, since the 1s and 2s subshells already have two electrons in them, it has to start occupying the 2p orbitals. And so now we have something called Hund's rule, which says that any empty orbitals within a subshell will be filled before electrons pair up. So basically, electrons don't like to be paired up because if they're paired up, then they're closer together and they have more repulsions. So in carbon, the next electron, instead of pairing up with this guy, it will go into an unfilled orbital within the 2p subshell. And same for nitrogen. So in the p subshells, the first three electrons will occupy separate orbitals. Only starting at the fourth electron, here at oxygen, do they start pairing up because now they have to pair up since all the three orbitals in the p subshell are filled by one electron at least. So then they begin to pair up in the p subshell until we get to neon which has a full p subshell. And so we often use electron configurations of the noble gases as abbreviations for higher elements. So for example, sodium is, is the one after neon, after the filled p orbital, the, the last electron goes to the 3s subshell. So instead of writing all this, we can instead write the neon in brackets, which stands for all of this, the electron configuration of neon, and then just add a 3s1 to the end. And so we call the electrons in the outermost principal quantum level of an atom valence electrons. For example, in fluorine, the highest principal level is 2. So all of these electrons would be valence electrons for a total of 7 valence electrons two in the S subshell and five in the P subshell. 
and then the rest of the electrons are called core electrons. So here there would be the two electrons in the 1s subshell. And so elements in the same group, which are the vertical columns in the peri periodic table, all have the same valence electron configuration. For example, sodium has one valence electron in the 3s or subshell. And potassium will also have one valence electron in the s subshell, but it will be in the 4s subshell, not the 3s. So we have a couple rules for writing electron configurations when we get d further down the periodic table. So the next level s orbitals will always fill before the d orbitals because they are actually lower in energy. For example, 4s will be filled before 3d, 6s will fill before 5d, and so on. So the electron configuration of potassium is, we use the ergon to abbreviate, and then the last electron goes in the 4s subshell, not the 3d subshell, as you might expect. And so the d orbitals start filling after the 4s subshell fills. So when we get to the transition metals, the, the first electron that goes in the d orbital will be in scandium. And so each section of the periodic table corresponds to one of the specific subshells being filled. So the first two columns are the s subshell. And then the transition metals will be the d subshells while the, the right side of the table with all the nonmetals and gases will be the p subshells. And then we have the lanthanoid and actinoid series, which are the f subshells. So you can start from hydrogen and just work your way across the periodic table, putting electrons in. So lanthanum is actually in the D, the D section. So its electron configuration is xenon 6s2 5d1. And then after lanthanum, before all the other transition metals fill the D orbitals, it will switch to the lanthanides and fill all the 4f orbitals. And then so, after the 4f orbitals are filled, it goes back to the transition metals to fill the d orbitals. And then similarly, we have actinium, which is also in the d orbitals. So its electron configuration is radon, 7s2, 6d1. And then after actinium, the actinides will fill the 5f orbitals. And then after the 5f orbitals fill, it will go back to the transition metals to fill the 6d orbitals. So let's look at some examples. So sulfur, the, the previous noble gas closest to it is neon. So neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then after neon, to get to sulfur, we go down a row, start at sodium, Sodium and magnesium will be the 3s2, and then we go across to aluminum, and we need 4 to get to sulfur, so 3p4. For cadmium, the closest noble gas is krypton, and then we go down one to rubidium. Rubidium and strontium will be the 5s2. And then we start filling the transition metals. And so cadmium is the last, last transition metal in this row. So it will go all the way up to 4d10, and which is the maximum for the d subshell. Remember that the d subshell has five orbitals, 
so it can hold 10 electrons. Next we have hafnium. The closest noble gas is xenon. And then we go down one to cesium and barium, which will make up the 6s2. And then we go to lanthanum. Remember, lanthanum is in the d orbitals, so one of them will go into 5d1. And then we go to the lanthanoid series, and all of these have to fill before we can go back to hafnium in the transition metals. So we have 4f14, and then we go back to hafnium for another one in the 5d orbital. So instead of writing 5d1 here for lanthanum, and then going to the F and back to the D, we just write the 4F14 and then the 5D2 at the end. And then last we have radium. The closest noble gas is radon, which is in the 6P6 subshell. And then we go down one. Francium and radium will be the 7S2. And so notice how the 7S block is the last block. There is no 7P, there's no 7P orbitals. And so there are some exceptions that you have to watch out for. Two of the most common ones are chromium and copper. So chromium, we'd expect it to be argon. 4s2 and then 3d4. However, one of the electrons in the 4s actually goes to the d. So we actually have 4s1, 3d5. And then same for copper. We expect it to be 4s2, 3d9. But one of the ones in the s goes to the 3d. So we have 4s1, 3d10. And so an easy way to remember this is in chromium, the 3D subshell is half filled, and in copper, it's all filled.